So welcome. Uh, this is the uh, Congregation Bethel Green Team um, webinar on sustainable gardening with, uh, with Jess. And we're going to begin with her in a few minutes. Um, I have just a couple of logistics. I want, first off, I want to thank Linda Klein for having organized this event. Um, she made it all possible. So kudos. Um, and Jess, you can thank her in a few moments after her presentation. Um, but thank you. Um, uh, we will have the, the chat function. I'll try and monitor the chat. If you have questions, go ahead and log them in. Um, initially, we'll have a presentation by Jessica, um, about 20, 25 minutes. And then we will have some testimonials from three Bethel's finest gardeners. And then we'll have Q&A at the end. Um, Linda, I'll ask if you can be the uh, moderator for picking up people yep. Yep. questions. Yep. Um, and I'll monitor the chat. Um, and we will, as I say, we're recording this event, so we can have it uh, available as a link afterwards. I'll send it to all the people who registered. If you're just showing up and you did not previously registered, welcome. Um, please send me your email, uh, and that way I can send you the link later on if you want to refer back to this. So with that, um, Linda, do you want to give any introductions here before we turn it over to Jessica? Uh, well, I think the rabbi was going to... Yes, very true. Let's start it off that way. Thanks. Rabbi, over to you. Thank you. I'm, I'm really quite honored to have been invited to come and oh. share a brief teaching. And I'd, I'd like to uh, just ask that if you're not actively speaking, would you please uh, mute your connection just for everyone's ease of hearing together on Zoom. So I have two objectives here. The first is for us to bless this new day of the counting of the Omer, twin Passover and Shavuot, which is bearing down on us with all the grace of an oncoming locomotive. And I'm planning Shavuot. And then I'd like to reflect with you for a very few brief moments about the intersection between sustainable gardening and Jewish ethics. So I love getting our daily proverbs here online with our accounting of the Omer. Today's, this new day of the Omer is a good name is more valuable than a velvet garment. So we can take that in, a good name. May we be known by the good name of stewards of the earth on this new day of the Omer, which we'll now bless together. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Asher kirishanu b'mitzvota v'tzivanu al sfirat ha-omer. Hayom, shmona u'shloshim yom, shehem chamisha shavuot u'shlosha yamim la-omer. Today is 38 days, which is five weeks and three days of the Omer. May that name be enduring for us as guardians of the earth. So this idea of sustainable gardening is something that I've heard of around and about. And I confess, I, I reached out to the wonderful organizers of tonight's program that I sadly am not going to be able to remain at with family responsibilities. And I said to them, so what is sustainable gardening? What is this philosophy? What is it about? And they unfolded all kinds of amazing Torah for us. And allow me to ask those who just joined, please, could you mute yourself for, again for, for everyone's uh, comfort. Thank you. So what is sustainable gardening about? And they gave all kinds of amazing Torah that I know that that Jess and, and the group here are going to unfold for you. One piece of it that I took away from their description is that it's about recognizing that we human beings are part of a system. And that system is one that considers creation in all of its forms, and specifically the earth. And seeing ourselves as part of a network that requires us to balance our desires and needs along with the regular, the, the rhythmic natural flow of the world around us. This week, we're about to be, we're, about, we're going to read Parashat Bechukotai. Last week, we read Parashat Bahar. And these two parshiot, these two segments of the Torah speak about Shemitah, this practice of letting go of our control over the earth. Hey, Jordan, would you mind muting, please? Thank you. One year out of every seven, 
we don't plant, we just allow the earth to lie fallow and we can eat whatever springs up, as Stephanie calls them, volunteer veggies. But we let the earth be, we let it refresh itself. And Shemitah is an example of sustainable agriculture. And biblical archeologists tell us that this is actually really good science, that you've got to let the earth sort of sit back and relax so that it can replenish itself with nutrients in the topsoil so that it can continue to offer a good yield. And yet as members of the Jewish community, we see another layer to it. We're drawn to recognize the holy sparks that exist in the world around us, the implicit idea of holiness in everything that we do and everything that we encounter. Our mystical tradition tells that, that the Ketayamim at the end of days in that, that mystical future world where everything is made whole, every day will be Shabbat and every place will be Eden once again. So as we care for the earth, as we find ourselves investing in sustainable practices that bring us into a rhythm and a flow that allow the earth to replenish itself and that see us as stewards of the earth rather than its, its dominators, we can allow our gardens to have that taste of Eden. We can allow that glimmer of holy light to emerge from the earth caught beneath our fingernails and, and in our back and side yards to become holy ground. May it be that this gathering inspires us to continue to be Shomrei Adama, to be guardians of the earth, to reinvest ourselves in caring for our beautiful created home and to gather new Torah, new wisdom so that we can appreciate all the more deeply the wondrous order, which is our world. Thank you for the invitation to share this brief teaching with you. And I'm excited to learn ever so briefly before I need to log off. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thanks, Janet, I appreciate the heart. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, Linda, over to you. Hi. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank the Rabbi for, for a beautiful, beautiful teaching. And I'm going to just tell you a little bit about Jess. I, um, I was so pleased to find out from Janet Buchwald, actually, that Jess, Jess Baker, in the midst of our congregation, is a master gardener. Who would have known? I didn't know. So although I'm, I asked her to give me a little um, brief understanding of where she, how she got to this. So I'm just going to read a few comments from her. Although Jess's interest in gardening is strictly amateur, she has pursued greater knowledge to become a master gardener. She was a staunch environmentalist committed to the local food movement when she received a lovely birthday gift from her husband, Doug Talamay's book, Bringing Nature Home. She says, I was enthralled by the idea that my garden could play an important role in the ecosystem. And she started taking classes and volunteering at Garden in the Woods to learn more about how her garden could play an important role in the ecosystem. Her fellow volunteers inspired and encouraged her to pursue the master gardening training. She says, I've taken the lessons to heart. She has transformed her lawn, front lawn, into a woodland garden in the shade and a vegetable garden and strawberry patch in the sun. She has done much more by replacing non-natives with a variety of native shrubs and trees resulting in lots of insects to feed the birds. And without further uh, talk on my part, I wanna welcome Jess and thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Linda. I think you just gave about half of my talk. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, and I'm so glad that we're in Zoom and not in person because I would have some wicked stage fright about now. Um, I'm going to turn off my camera before I uh, start screen sharing because the Wi-Fi where I'm at is not the best. So let me do that and then I'll start screen sharing and then we will get on our way. If I can find it, here we go. All right, everybody see it? It's good. Um, We're good. So, a note about this slide, the photo of the hummingbird drinking from the native honeysuckle 
Lonicera Semperverans, was taken by my son in our backyard. Um, I think you've all gotten the handout that I prepared that has all the websites I'm gonna mention, so you don't need to write anything down. And I've also numbered the slides. So if you have questions on specific things, you can note that down and we can circle back. So what does it mean to landscape sustainably? For me, it means limiting my use of outside resources. Everything I need for my healthy garden is already on site. It means that my garden is part of a larger ecosystem. What I do on my land affects that ecosystem. So the top photo shows a conventional landscape. Here, aesthetics are more important than the environment. It has the lawn that uses lots of resources, mulch bought from somewhere, probably in plastic bags, and, and a few plants scattered about. The bottom photo shows a sustainable approach. It uses green mulch, that is plants, that are self-sustaining and support wildlife. When you have a sustainable landscape, you conserve energy and water, improve air and water quality, you improve soil health, reduce erosion, reduce your carbon footprint, and you support wildlife. So let's start with the ground up. The first step is understand your soil profile. This lets you know what plants will do well in your yard, how water moves on your land, and how to improve your soil health. Healthy soil means healthy plants. Now, healthy soil is full of microscopic life. The book Teeming with Microbes says that a single teaspoon of healthy soil contains a billion bacteria, several yards of fungal hyphae, several thousand protozoa, and a few dozen nematodes. How these microorganisms interact by eating each other, excreting and decomposing, keeps nutrients in the soil and informs that the plant can use. And when nematodes and other organisms move through the soil, they create little tunnels for air and water and that helps decompact the soil. So as you can see in the diagram, the microbes not only give nutrients back to the plants, they're also the foundation of the food web. They support wildlife all the way up to birds and mammals. Synthetic fertilizers are mostly salt-based. Think about what happens when you put salt on a slug. It shrivels up. When you add fertilizers to your plants, you're inadvertently killing the organisms that support those plants. And obviously if you use pesticides and herbicides, you're killing them too. So key point in sustainable gardening that I want you to remember, it's all about the bugs. The texture of your soil determines how well it holds moisture and, excuse me, moisture and nutrients. Ideal garden soil is called loam, bottom center of the diagram. It has the right balance of small particles of clay and silt that hold moisture and enough larger sand particles to let the water drain. Most of us in Metro West are going to have loamy sand or sandy loam in the bottom left corner. The USDA has a really good website called Web Soil Survey where you can search by your address and get your soil profile. It's not intuitive, so there are instructions in the handout. My soil profile in Sudbury is loamy sand. This means I have dry soil. Water drains right through. Plants that prefer dry, dry soils or are drought tolerant do much better in my garden than plants that like wet feet. The best way to improve soil texture is to add compost. Compost is full of those microbes we just talked about. So it adds nutrients and helps the soil hold moisture. In the beds where I've regularly added compost and used leaf mulch, if there hasn't been rain in a while and I dig down, it still feels moist. In other areas of my yard, it looks like a sandbox. To pH. So all plants have a preferred soil pH. Most of us in Metro West have acidic soils. Urban or disturbed areas might be some exceptions. So you can find out your soil's pH with a simple soil test through UMass Amherst. If you have acidic soil, but you want a plant that needs sweeter or alkaline soil, you have to add something like lime or dolomite to change the pH. But remember to be sustainable, we wanna use what we already have and pH affects which nutrients are available to the plants. So the famous example of blue hydrangea flowers in acidic soil and pink flowers in basic soil is actually because the plant can absorb iron in acidic soils, but not basic. So it's the iron that turns the flower blue. So here are some things everyone can do to get healthy soil. Add compost. 
It inoculates the soil with diverse microbes, and as they decompose the organic matter, they restore nutrients. Use shredded leaves as mulch. This adds nutrients faster to the soil because it decomposes faster than conventional mulch like wood chips or bark. If the wood chips haven't been comp composted properly, they actually take nitrogen out of the soil as they start to decompose. You can shred your own leaves with a mulching mower or a leaf shredder. We use both. We rake the leaves into strips and mow them with our electric mower. This makes a coarser mulch, so we put it in a chicken wire bin to compost for a season. We also have a leaf shredder, which cuts the leaves more finely. I usually put these in a bin too, but I know gardeners who put the fresh shredded leaves right back on the bed. If you have an area where you can let the leaves be, they will protect the soil from drying out and they'll break down over time. They also provide coverage for overwintering insects, which we'll talk about more later. And try to avoid peat. Many bagged composts and potting soils use peat. Peat moss is a non-renewable resource. It takes a long time to form. Mining it releases carbon and disrupts the peat bog ecosystem. So read labels carefully. And if you find a good potting soil without peat, please let me know because I'm still looking. All right, now that we've covered soil, let's talk about the other resource plants need, water. This graph shows droughts in Massachusetts over the last 20 years. And you can see the increase in the last 10 years. And we know that with climate change, it's only going to get worse. So as water becomes more scarce, it makes no sense to me to use it for the vanity of our landscapes. The best way to conserve water in your garden is to grow native plants. Native plants evolved within our ecosystem. That means they are adapted to the local conditions and they'll rarely require extra water once they're established. To take advantage of rainfall, you need to know how water moves on your land. So next time there's a good steady rain, suit up and walk around your property. Watch where the water flows. Where are the low spots where it collects? If water is running off your land down the storm drain in the street, think about using a swale to redirect it back into the garden or install a rain garden, which is basically a depression that collects water and uses plants that can absorb it, but also tolerate dry periods. Rain barrels, rain barrels are a great way to collect rainwater for the garden. Sometimes you can find community rain barrel programs. I got mine pictured here through a Sudbury program with the Great American Rain Barrel Company. They sell repurposed barrels that were once used for shipping olives. And to limit runoff, try to minimize impervious surfaces. Think about using pavers instead of concrete. Or next time you need to redo your driveway, there's a porous asphalt on the market now. And don't use sealants on your driveway because the chemicals that run off pollute waterways. A rain gauge measures how much rain actually fell during a storm. You'd be surprised how little rain sometimes falls when you think it was a big downpour. I have a simple cup like this one. It nestles in the ground and you barely notice it. And you can also get fancy decorative ones. Um, you wanna know how much rain falls because if you have a young plant that you're trying to establish and there was less than half an inch of rain that week, it might need extra water. When you know how much rain fell over a period of time and you know your plant's watering needs, then you can use water more responsibly rather than standing out there with a gushing hose for who knows how long. Okay, we've covered soil and water. Now let's talk about plants. Right plant, right place. You know what your soil and water conditions are, so you can choose plants that are guaranteed to thrive in your landscape without additional resources. For all the people out there who say they kill everything, you won't if you put the right plant in the right place. So first, what do we mean when we say native plant? Plants are native if they existed in a region without human introduction. That means they co-evolved with the local site conditions and the local fauna. So to say a plant is native to Massachusetts can be misleading. Plants obviously don't know about geographic borders. A plant native to Cape Cod won't necessarily be adapted to the ecosystem in the Berkshires. So we say plants are native to a certain ecoregion. That's an area with similar ecosystems. So you can see from the Native Plant Trust map here that we are in the Northeastern coastal zone. There's a Facebook group called Native Plants of New England. It's a great source of information, but the people on there can get a little extreme about only using natives for your ecoregion. I'm not a purist, 
I have many plants that are native to regions south or west of us. As climate change advances, these plants will still offer benefits to wildlife and certainly more so than an introduced species. But why are native plants so important? Because they co-evolved with the native fauna, they support the unique needs of that fauna. Many Lepidoptera, that's butterflies and moths, are specialists. That means they only lay eggs on specific host plants. The monarch butterfly is the poster child of specialists. Monarchs lay their eggs on plants in the milkweed family. Without milkweed, there is no next generation of monarchs. So native plants are host plants for specialist insects. Natives are good for wildlife. They require less water and other amendments, and they provide a sense of place. Think about a stand of mountain laurel. It feels a lot more like New England than say a stand of bamboo. Okay, I wanna make sure we're clear on terminology. A native plant can be aggressive. We call these garden thugs, but it can never be invasive. Adaptive plants were introduced to the landscape by humans. They can thrive in the local climate and soil conditions. They might offer some wildlife benefit like nectar for pollinators, but not always. Some conventional gardeners will tell you that plants brought over by colonists 400 years ago and that have naturalized in our landscapes are native enough, but those plants won't serve as hosts for specialized insects. Most of the plants you get at a garden center are adaptive plants. A cultivar is a plant that has been bred for a specific trait, like a certain color foliage or a large flower head. All cultivars are clones because if the nursery is selling, say, a variegated hosta, not native, by the way, then all the plant stock needs to be the same. So you can tell a cultivar at the garden center because of the English word after the Latin name. So here, this is a photo of Penstemon digitalis husker red. It's a cultivar of a native plant, common name beer tongue. So nativar is another word for cultivars of native plants. Penstemon is a great native flower. I've seen hummingbirds and butterflies at mine, but there's new research that shows that the purple leaves of cultivars like husker red are of no use to specialist insects. They either don't recognize the host plant or they don't like something about it, I forget exactly. But the ecological benefit of native ours may not be as good as the straight species. But like I said, I'm no purist. I have plenty of cultivars and native ours. Sometimes that's all you can find. I do try to prioritize straight species of native plants. And I make a point of asking the nursery so they know there's demand for it. After straight species, I go to native ours. And I reserve adapted plants for really special specimens like my rosebush or peonies. So now that we've defined what a native plant is, what about invasives? What's the big deal? An invasive species is an introduced or adapted plant that has escaped cultivation and threatens the local ecosystem. They outcompete and take over land that used to be occupied by native plants. Think about all the roadsides you see full of Japanese knotweed and Asiatic bittersweet. Since they did not co-evolve with the fauna, they are not useful host plants. Their fruits often don't supply adequate nutrition to wildlife. Some are alleliopathic, which means they emit chemicals in the ground that keeps other plants from growing nearby. Invasives produce lots of seeds and berries and some spread by underground rhizomes, and they are very difficult to get rid of. Invasives that we see in the landscape include from the top, Barbary, Japanese and Maro honeysuckle, burning bush. I know everybody loves their burning bush, but it is a terrible, terrible plant. Autumn olive and not pictured here, buckthorn. But just because you have one seemingly well-behaved bush in your yard, remember the birds are eating the berries and dispersing the seed elsewhere. I wanna mention a note about Barbary. There have been studies that show where there's Barbary, there are large tick populations. Barbary's thorns are great habitat for the white-footed mouse and its berries are plentiful food. The white-footed mouse is the primary vector for deer ticks. So if you have a booming population of field mice, you're gonna have a lot of ticks. There are plants that are not officially on the invasive species list in Massachusetts, but they might be invasive in adjacent regions like butterfly bush, which is invasive in the South and mid-Atlantic states. And that's butterfly bush, the Budleia species, not butterfly weed, which is Asclepias tuberosa in the milkweed family. Important not to confuse those. But with climate change, it's reasonable to expect that these plants that are invasive near us 
may become invasive here too. So I think it's best to avoid them. And there are other plants that aren't invasive but behave really aggressively. You see them spreading beyond property lines into woods and conservation land like vinca or pachysandra or boston ivy. They provide zero ecological benefit and they take space away from natives. So one of the joys of gardening is attracting butterflies and birds to your backyard. These photos, except for the chickadee, are all from my garden. But it's important to support wildlife at all stages. If you have lots of nectar plants for butterflies, but no host plants for their larvae, there won't be any more butterflies. Likewise, if you want to attract different birds, then you should know that nearly all birds feed their young insects. The young need protein to grow, right? So if you have a barren landscape, and by barren, I mean a large conventional lawn and flower beds that have more mulch than plants, then you are not supporting the full life cycle of birds. So as Linda mentioned, Doug Tallamy is an entomologist at the University of Delaware, and his book, Bringing Nature Home, is the Bible of the native plant movement. His work pioneered the connection between native plants, insect populations, and the health of the greater ecosystem. He recommends that 70% of the plants in your garden should be, neighbor, should be native, excuse me. And remember what I said earlier, it's all about the bugs. Many of our beneficial insects overwinter in leaf litter. When you rake away all your leaves or worse, have a gas guzzling landscape company suck them up into a truck, you are carting away the next generation of insects. Do you remember seeing a lot more fireflies in the summer than you do today? That's because firefly beetles spend most of their life as larvae in the leaf litter. So try to find areas where you can leave your leaves. I have some beds that I have leaf covered until spring. Leaves that I do need to clear, I dump in the edges of our lot where we don't walk. In the spring, try to wait until there are five consecutive days above 50 degrees before cleaning up your leaves. By then you should see insects flitting about. Lawns. Lawns are frankly environmentally criminal. I'm sorry, they are. No turf grass is native to our region. Turf provides no ecological benefit. The perfect turf lawn requires huge amounts of water, fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides to stay green. For those who use their own well water for irrigation, you're still taking from the groundwater that feeds the public water supply. When you fertilize, the plant only absorbs a small amount of the nutrients. The rest wash away in either surface runoff or seep into groundwater. Either way, polluting the waterways. That's why all the ponds you see driving around are covered in green sludge all summer. The algae has gotten a nice nitrogen boost from suburban lawns. Residual pesticides and herbicides also wash away and pollute waterways, not to mention the carbon footprint to produce, package, and ship these products and of course, the fossil fuel consumption of lawn equipment. So if you have a big lawn, it can feel really overwhelming to tackle. The first step is to consider, how do you use the area? It's okay to have some lawn for recreation, but if there are parts that are strictly ornamental, could you convert it to a meadow or a strawberry patch or a place for shrubs and ground covers or some trees? We kept lawn in the back for soccer and we converted the sunny part of our front yard into a vegetable garden and strawberry patch, as Linda already said. So think about how the area can better serve the ecosystem. All right, I covered a lot of ground. My advice is to start small. Think about where you can start to make changes. Growing native plants doesn't mean going wild, though you can certainly do that too. Join the rewilding movement. But if you prefer the look of a manicured yard, you can do that with native plants. I do think it's important to embrace a little mess, limit your fall cleanup by leaving the leaves, don't cut back all the flower heads. The seeds provide food for birds. I love seeing juncos and goldfinches perch on the black-eyed Susan stems in winter. And some insects, especially native bees, overwinter in the hollow stems of the sturdier perennials. A few points on this list that I didn't cover earlier. So for compost, if you don't have space or interest in composting, I think Bethel has a program with black earth compost for curbside pickup. I don't know the details of how you buy back their compost. I believe they deliver. And also Codman Farm in Lincoln gets a big delivery from them every spring. You bring your own five gallon bucket and self-serve, $5 a bucket. What's nice about black earth is that they're local and because they deliver, you can avoid the plastic packaging. Leave tree snags. Try to avoid cutting down trees altogether, please. 
but if you must take down a tree, consider cutting the trunk so 10 to 12 feet remain. That's called a snag. It's a haven for insects and provides food for woodpeckers and other birds. If it has any cavities, it provides habitat for birds or mammals, and it can be an interesting structural piece. I have two snags in my backyard. Big box stores ship in their plants from who knows where. You don't know what pesticides they pre-treat their plants with, and sometimes they genetically modify them so the pesticides are within the plants. So always best to shop local. Try to find plants that were grown as locally as possible to cut down on the carbon footprint. And lastly, say no to tree volcanoes. This is more a horticultural point than a sustainable practice per se, but it's one of my pet peeves. A tree volcano is the mound of mulch you see piled around a tree base. You should be able to see the root flare. That's the part where the root starts to spread out into the ground. If the bottom of a tree looks like a telephone pole going straight into the ground, that's no good. Oxygen exchange takes place at the root flare. So if it's buried under mulch, the tree won't thrive. It's also a complete waste of mulch, which landscapers sell by the yard. So that's it. Thank you for offering me this soapbox. Um, and if I haven't scared you off and you want to discuss more, I always love to talk plants. And now I have to figure out how to stop sharing. Thank you, Jess. Uh, so we have, um, I'm going to turn it over to Linda. She um, has organized three um, testimonials from Bethel folks. Um, Jess, I, um, I'll note that there are some questions that are coming into the chat. Um, so while the testimonials are going on, you can also take a browse through there and then we can turn to those at the beginning of the Q&A section. Um, and Ellen Tone will moderate the Q&A and I'll moderate the chat. Um, when we do get to the q and I'll ask if people are doing questions, if they can just raise their hands um, on the screen or put them in the chat. Thank you. So um, over to you, Linda. Great. Uh, Jessica, thanks so much. So we have three people here, uh, our own members, who are going to give testimonials, Janet Buckwald, and then Shirley Huey and Dave Fitzpatrick. So uh, Janet, if you would go first and We've asked them to keep it short to about three minutes at the most, but two to three. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Linda. I, uh, I'm really an accidental gardener, and I would like to say a few words in praise of weeds. I know many weeds are um, invasive and they're not native, but there are some wonderful ones, the ultimate volunteers. Um, and many weeds such as dandelions, Queen Anne's lace and violets are great for pollinators. And many weeds such as dandelions, Queen Anne's lace, otherwise known as uh, carrot, uh, wild carrot and violets and lamb's quarters are wonderfully edible. And who wouldn't want some free food right around now with inflation being what it is. And as climate change um, affects our environments, we need plants like weeds that are adapted to grow where they are. They're much better adapted to grow in this environment than some of the cultivated plants that we grow. And a caveat here, never eat any plant based on something that I say, but do your research and make sure you know what you have. But um, they are some one, I have a pot of Japanese knotweed on the stove right now because you need to eat your invasives. Um, now the way you say weeds in Hebrew is tzimche bar. That literally means uh, plants of an uncultivated field or plants of the wild. So I would encourage everybody for the beauty, for the nativeness, for the thrill of discovery to take a walk on the wild side. And after some careful research, eat your Wheaties. You're funny. That's great. Would you send us some recipes too? <laughs> Thanks, Janet. Uh, Shirley, I have you in the roster there, uh, but I don't see you up on here. So I'm here. Oh, there she is. Yes. Thank you, Shirley. Hi. Um, okay. Well, so I guess I would have to say I'm on the other end of the spectrum from Janet because I'm a long-term perennial gardener and have plants all over my, you know, yard. Um, but I have to say, I didn't know the origin. I'm a 
just a gardener. I love this plant. I got one, I put one in, you know, whatever. They go all over the place. But, um, you know, as you learn about things and hear about things, I'm trying to figure out now, what do I do that most of my garden is well established? So how do I decide now what to do? Um, so luckily or not, we had to have some extensive drainage work done in the backyard. So it gave me some new garden beds. And since I was just learning about nerd natives at the time, I tried to plant natives and plant some good annuals like zinnias are also great for um, the insects and the birds. And as uh, just mentioned, I've also learned that the garden center, even though they say it's native, the plants possibly modified and now not beneficial. So I, you know, I was un, I didn't know and bought many plants that were, you know, in uh, that category. So now I buy, try to buy all my plants from the Native Plant Trust in Framingham. There's Grow Native in Massachusetts. And one online site that I like is called Prairie Moon Nursery. And they're in um, Minnesota or Wisconsin, but um, they um, definitely are all straight species uh, plants. So that's what I'm trying to do, of course, going forward. And the, you know, so unlike eating all of those invasives, I'm trying to get rid of all the garlic mustard, the English ivy that's been creeping from my neighbors two doors down lily of the valley and um you know that's sort of the uh, primary focus in the early spring because if you can get them early you don't have to worry about them as much the rest of the season although the lily of the valley just is relentless um second i've been trying to reduce my lawn because i've never done the whole shebang with the the lawn is, is, if it's green, it's fine with me, but I've decided to try to replace. So my front lawn is now about um, a third um, with a native strawberry. And I started that from three plants from um, Native Plant Trust about two, uh, starting two seasons ago. And it's been going great. Um, the next is to try to figure out of my non-native plants, if they have native versions, to get rid of them and replace them. So I just got rid of my European ginger and I hope to add some native wild ginger. Now the rest of the plants are just gonna have to, you know, um, there's like the peonies are staying, the daylilies are staying and the rest are going to um, just um, be there until I can figure out what else um, would can um, replace them that are more beneficial. And as it goes, I'm. I've got um, um, a ton of the butterfly weed and all the new things that I've been learning about um, that are that are out there that are beautiful. And um, so I think that what's very hard for someone who's an established has an established gardener, what do you do? Um, I don't think that there's a need to pull everything out unless you really want to, but um, but make continue to make good decisions to replace what's there. Uh, and then lastly, I've been planting uh, one or two trees every year. And I know I planted a uh, black gum, um, Tupelo, and uh, several Atlantic white cedar. And now I have my fun tree this year is called a pawpaw tree, which is a native fruiting tree. Uh, so it's a lot of fun to try out a bunch of new plants, and I know that they're small, and I'm not going to see them full grown, but a future generation will benefit from them. So that's me. Surely, wow. I'm, Ellen, I'm going to ask, um, Linda, I'm taking license on the moderating. You you laid out a few sources and where you're um, procuring. Oh, sure. I'll Those put them in the uh, chat. chat. And then John also will do a fantastic job of Compiling we have one, one more one more testimonial from Dave Fitzpatrick, who did not resist ripping out everything according to what he told. Me. <laughs> Perfect. So um, thanks, thanks, Linda. Um, I moved to this house uh, about five years ago, and uh, one of the first things that struck me was that it was a lot quieter. Um, there weren't as many birds or butterflies, and even though I'm next to a park and not far from water. I was, uh, I was a little caught off guard. 
and uh, it bothered me. So I looked around and realized that this attractive Japanese themed garden that I had uh, at the house was really attractive to human eyes, but more or less valueless to the uh, to the natives, to the moths, butterflies, various birds. And while a few birds came to the bird feeder, there wasn't much else. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not Shirley. <laughs> um, I'm uh, more of a beginner gardener. So a couple of years ago, I just took the ugliest portion of my garden um, and uh, started ripping things out and tried a few native plants. Some survived, some didn't, um, and kind of inched my way forward. It's been very much an incremental process. And at first, I just wanted to have some value to the natives. Um, and I, you know, my thinking was, why wouldn't I put in attractive plants that are low maintenance, don't use neat chemicals, and are beneficial to the wildlife? Um, so that that made a lot of sense, and still makes a lot of sense to me. Um, now I've continued to just attack each new area of my yard, um, and my thinking's evolved. So now I'm thinking about not only having some value, but do I have berries for the berry eating birds? Do I have um, the nectars that will appeal to various moths and to the other birds? Do I have ho areas where the, uh, the animals can live? Uh, mostly moths, but native bees, things like that. Um, and do I have these in each of the seasons? So my thinking has gotten more sophisticated, but you don't need to start there. You can just start with a couple plants, start doing something that's a contribution and each step is something. Um, I relied very heavily on the garden plant finder from the Native Plant Trust that a few people have referenced. Um, it's wonderful because you can say, you know, this is my uh, soil type, this is my sunlight, how wet or dry it is, and um, various attributes of the plant and you can, it'll make recommendations. And so for a noob like me, um, it was very helpful in getting me started. Um, at this point, I've now put in a great many plants, ripped out uh, large chunks of my uh, old, old yard. Um, I haven't attacked the grass yet, but I have been going after the English ivy. And um, last year, we actually got it certified as a wildlife habitat. A uh, gardener I was working with because I needed some advice um, surprised me with that um, because there are enough plants that support enough unique species of bees and moths and butterflies um, that it, it has started to have some real value. Uh, mostly, I value it as a way to have a conversation, and I'd welcome a conversation with anyone who's on this call um, to talk about this uh, offline. Um, but it's been a wonderful journey and I feel a lot better. And I do see an increase in the number of um, solitary bees, uh, the birds, and th there has been an impact in the yard. It's been a, a uh, meaningful project to me. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. I think I'm gonna turn it over to Ellen now. Yeah, so um, thanks. I can see the robust conversation going on in the chat. So here's what I'm doing. I, I pulled some questions from the chat to pose to people to respond to. But also, I can't see every screen, John, but if people could raise their hand electronically or put their hands up, we'll try and do some, you know, I'll, we'll try and scan as well as going to the chat. So um, I think there's some uh, questions about native land cover. Howard had a couple of questions, but one was, you know, when you're doing a ground cover, say Jessica or Shirley, Shirley mentioned her strawberries. So this relates to a question from, um, Barry too. Uh, the question to you surely was common strawberries. What was that? And then maybe back to Jessica or Dave or Janet. Uh, what are your suggestions around um, native ground covers if you're going to get rid of your grass? Surely want to start then Jessica and anybody else chime in? Um, sure. So the, the strawberry that I bought it from Native Plant Trust are Virginia, uh, Fragraria Virginiana wild common, it's wild strawberry, and it's not the cultivated strawberry that we eat, and it's not alpine strawberry. And I planted um, at one section of my lawn that um, had tried to redo, and it was basically all crabgrass, and I just, it was just not, and then my landscaper said, oh, we, we should put down sod, and I said, stop, no, no sod. So <laughs> I started cutting out little patches of this crabgrass with the three plants. And as they grew runners, I kept enlarging the bed. 
and kept enlarging it and enlarging it from there. So that's um, that's how it's gotten there. I'm gonna to try to find a picture uh, on my phone that I could show you. So you can go on while I look for this photo. Jessica, thoughts on this? Yeah, so ground covers, I mean, one, it depends, is it a full sun or part shade? Because that will also affect what you can do. But one really popular thing in addition to strawberry is uh, Carex Pennsylvanica, which is a um, the Nate, Nate Pennsylvania sedge. Um, and that fills in and kind of has like a, a rolling, not quite a lawn, it kind of like flops over, but can be very pretty. Um, and I just had, oh, purple love grass. I don't remember the Latin name of that, but that does well in the sun. And it puts off these like fuzzy purple flowers um, that are really neat to see when it's a huge mass of it. Um, for sort of part shade, part sun, like in the picture behind me, this is um, Phlox stolonifera and actually Garden in the Woods has like a whole hillside covered in it. So the flowers are blooming now, but then after they die back, um, it's just a ground cover and it's filled in pretty quickly. Um, I think Shirley mentioned uh, like the native ginger is one that I'm really fond of. There's barren strawberry, which also I don't remember exactly the Latin name of that, but it, it doesn't produce fruit, but it has a leaf similar to strawberry and has a little yellow flower. I convinced Sarah to put some in her yard. Um, so yeah, there, there's lots of options. And it, again, will kind of depend of if it's full sun, some of those may not tolerate it as well. You might want to look at some of the native grasses. Um, but part, if you have part shade, some of these other ones will be more, they'll like it better. It'll be a little cooler for them. A, a, a follow up to that, um, and I see your hand, Joel, is a uh, Judith asked, what about clover or micro clover? Since we're, we're in this category of, you know, alternative to lawn cover. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't think they're, te they're not technically native, but I think if, you know, certainly if it's a lawn that you're using, like I've let the clover go wild in my lawn and I'd rather have clover than turf grass. So, you know, it's a compromise. Okay. Um, Jessica, if you could, in the chat, write a few of those down. It was it was uh, hard to take notes as fast as you were rifling through them. And then, you know, of course, you've identified great places people can go to get ideas, but just put a few of those in the chat. So, Joel, I'll take your question, and then I'm going to go to, like, three from the chat that I've seen. Sometimes people ask about, uh, what are my neighbors going to say if I don't have a lawn in front of my home? And I just want to sort of reassure people that I turned my lawn into a vegetable and flower garden. And all the neighbors who walk by thank me each time they go by for uh, having some variety in the neighborhood. And uh, I would encourage people to not worry about what the neighbors are going to think, but uh, that they may appreciate your plantings more than the noise of your lawnmower. Uh, okay. Thank, thanks for that. This is another question I'm putting in, Jessica, that someone else asked about ground covers, and you can just see it in the chat and you can respond to it there. Oh, so, yeah. um, I no. see some questions about um, bird feeder versus plant, and then people chime me in saying eh, seeds are okay, but they can also drop. So, commentary on um, uh, bird feeders as a supplement. As how do we feel about bird feeders? I guess is the big question. Um, I'm in here. Yeah, so I mean, I have bird feeders. I use them more in the winter. I don't fill them in the summer one to encourage the birds to eat the insects and, you know, write what I'm planting, but also because they attract bears. So, okay. I guess, um, I guess I'd add that um, the seeds that you, the birds that go to your bird feeder are doing fine. Generally, the ones that are struggling with their populations are the ones who don't come to the feeder. So putting in the native plants is a great way to kind of reach that those populations. That's a great, it's a great point. Um, a great point, Dave. Um, Howard asked early in this, um, someone else, Shirley, you want to, was someone else chiming in on the bird question? I didn't want to cut people off. Um, Howard asked early on, um, if you're capturing rain that's, uh, water that's run off from asphalt, are you worried at all about what's in that water and what it might be picking up? Um, for just a perennial bed, no. Um, for a vegetable garden, you might think about it. Um, I actually have used my rainbow water um, in my vegetable gardens and sort of figured to heck with it. But that's one thing that I found conflicting research about if is it okay to use in a vegetable garden. But if you're not eating it, who cares? It's fine. Okay. I, I want to go to the mulching category because there are a couple of questions related. I'm trying to group these. 
So um, Sally says, uh, I can see Sally, you know, where is Sally? It's that uh, you, uh, you're you using pine, pine needles and mulch, but you're also sort of thinking about moss, which is growing a bunch. How's that for, for ground cover? Th those are your questions? You have to unmute Sally. So the, the pine needles was in where I've planted, like instead of, um, like to keep the weeds down. I, I throw the pine needles after I after the perennials come up and after I put down a few new things each year, I throw pine needles all over it. Um, as, as, I don't know whether it's a mulch or whatever it's called, but that's what I do and I never clean them up. I just add every year more pine needles. And then the moss is a question I'm, loving that it's taking over my lawn and I wonder if there's any downside to that and if there's not is there a way to put more moss there like like encourage what I have but also you know transplant some that I could get somewhere it's very <coughs> low maintenance and it's very spongy and green <laughs> and I, I don't like having the lawn someone want to jump on this one Jessica anybody else Pine needles, um, it's fine. I think it's not necessarily as nutritious as the shredded leaves. Um, doesn't put the nutrients back in, but certainly better than using conventional mulch. And I'm sorry, I was also replying to something in the chat. So what was the second part of the question? About moss. moss. Oh yeah, moss is great. I love moss. I don't know if you can buy it. Um, one of the horticulturalists at uh, Native Plant Trust just had a class on mosses recently. So I'm sure she'll offer it again sometime. So you know, I highly recommend their classes. Um, I once took a class where there years ago where they talked about like collecting moss from different places. You could make like a, you mix it up in the blender and then you paint it on rocks and it just grows. Um, so moss, I think you just kind of let it do its thing. I, I don't know if you can buy it. Maybe you can, I don't know. Yeah, I've actually done that uh, blended up moss and I think I put milk in or something. And yeah, spread yeah. It the, uh, uh, in between the cracks and crevices have some uh, pavers and stuff like that and it just happily took over yeah um, um i just want to talk more about mulching here uh, i put out the question you know uh we do rake our leaves and sort of mulch them up with our electric lawnmower let me also just put in a pluck here for electric devices if you are using something mechanical there's lots of good choices here these days uh, John was an early adapter on the electric lawnmower, and I'm definitely sold. Um, we've used it for many years. Um, but I um, I didn't want to shred ours more, so surely put in the chat what the one that you have for Amazon. You have one, Jessica. This actually strikes me as one of those things where you all don't need to own it, um, right? We use it periodically, and so there could be something where we're happy to own it and lend it out to other people at Bethel if we can find one that easily fits in the back of the... Uh, the car, you know, it, it seems like it's crazy that we all own something that we use just a couple of times. So I'd be interested if anybody wants to be about part of a uh, leaf shredding uh, co-op, so to speak. Um, but there were some questions about if you don't rake your, and you can, so put that in the chat if, you, if you're interested in joining John and I on that. Some people say if you don't rake your leaves, you know, you can get leaf mold and could be an as, you know, it's creating sort of an allergic reaction. Any thoughts about too much leaf stagnating and leading to mold and it's not great for their asthma and I can't remember who it was. Okay. All right, I'm gonna to go to Gail's question. Yes or no on raised beds, like what Black Earth Compost recommends? Yeah, I put that in the, I did reply to that in the chat, but maybe I'll stop yes. yeah, no, mentioning the chat. Um, yeah, res beds are great for veggie gardens, but not necessary for perennials and wildlife gardening. Can you just say more about why you feel that way? Um, well, so you use raised beds in vegetable gardening because you need a much looser soil and you need, you know, for the roots to go and you want, you need to control that soil a lot more um, versus perennial gardens that you're letting just go wild, like it's part of the ground you're not separating it out a raised bed is earth that's a soil that is separated out you know for a specific purpose okay john do we end at 8 30 john linda when are we ending yes we ended at 8 30 so we'll, we'll wind this down in a couple of minutes okay and i because i think i want to do this last pitch on the 
website stuff. So. Yep. So on, uh, if if you have a couple more, you know, like two more questions, and then we can turn to the website. Um, is there? I saw one earlier from Howard about groundhogs eating Rebecca. Any suggestions? I think Shirley, you said something about chicken wire, but thoughts on this? Um, we have a million rabbits. We don't have any dogs or, or in the yard. Apparently, the dogs dogs will chase them all away. I just chase them around the yard when I see them. Um, but the only way that I mean, I bought these beautiful um, blue, uh, native low bush blueberry. I planted them in my brand new garden to find like a few days later, they had been chewed to the nubs. And so everything else that went into my garden uh, after that is caged in chicken wire until they get large enough that um, they are, um, you know, um, more healthy and then, uh, you know, can sustain being chewed. Um, or I see that the rabbits don't really care about them so much. Um, I have one and I cannot remember the name of that, but it's encaged in chicken wire. It escaped the chicken wire completely. The rabbits chewed it to the chicken wire, but the plant is still there. So, you know, um, it, it lives to tell another, you know, tale. So. Yeah, I have a groundhog. Um, I don't have a solution for it. It's uh, I, voles are a bigger challenge for me. I have lost many, many plants to voles. And in fact, this is one argument for raking away the leaves. So I have one bed that I didn't get around to raking in the fall. I left the leaves all winter. And when I pulled them back this spring, I'd say 60 to 70% of my plants were gone. Um, so if it's an area where you know you have voles, that would be a place to rake. Don't leave the leaves. Um, and then it's just heartbreak. It's just annual heartbreak. All right. I think we'll take Lee's last question, although I am attracted to the question around fox pee. Just for well, uh, so um, we um, I've been in my house for 40, 45 years or so, and um, we used to have a huge groundhog problem. I use fox pee, which is now called predator urine and supposedly they collect it from I don't know foxes that are running over grids or something um, in any event it works really well either to dribble it around or if you have a larger garden I take a cotton clothesline put it in a bucket a, a length like that's like as big as your perim garden perimeter if you can roll up the cotton clothesline put it in a bucket and pour the, pour the predator urine over it and cover it with, oh, outside, cover it with plastic wrap overnight, and then just thread it through your garden fence about four inches above the ground, and the groundhogs will not come near it. And even if you don't have a garden fence, they they avoid it. Okay. All right, I think we're at 8.30, John, so. Um, yep, if you want to talk about uh, mass energize. Yeah, I do want to do that. So, um, uh, and also there was a question about um, uh, visiting gardens. So surely I, I saw for sure said people can Come visit. So maybe just in a follow-up email, you know, John and Linda, you guys can think about um, how to facilitate that. Or uh, well, I've, um, in addition to that, there are a number of comments that have been in chat about uh, how this group can be mobilized to help Bethel's own gardens. So yep. um, I will send an email out to the people who pre-registered because I have your email addresses. If you didn't pre-register and you haven't sent me an email uh, asking for the um, um, handout from Jessica, please do send me an email and then I can include you on this because the garden committee would love to have your assistance and um, we will put you in touch and see if we can have you um, come help. Yep, I think wants assistance and Joel and specifically noted they're looking for some people to help water in the in the um, super hot periods. So as you as most of you know, Bethel was the first congregation to help populate this Jewish Climate Action Network um, website also set up with Mass Energize. Um, and if you have not created a profile, which you do up here in the right button, you'll see I have a profile um, which tells you all the things I've done and the things I want to do. Um, it gives you a to do list and what you've done. Um, we really would like you to create a profile. Our goal is that a third of all Bethel members, a half of all Bethel members, will have taken some action on climate change. We're about up to 70 of us. And I suspect there are people on this call have done things related to the climate, including 
uh, eco landscaping, not saying that we've done it. We want to be vocal and visible in the way that we're responding to the climate crisis. So I encourage you to create a profile. And when you create a profile, just to remind you, you'll, you'll go to teams and you will join the Bethel team and you can see there are sub teams. So if you if you're part, if you feel like you want to be part of Bethel Earthworms, um, join that team or any other team or create a team of your friends at Bethel uh, to try and get them to join. You can then send emails to the team. But I want to, what I want to point you to is um, that we do list actions, and one of the actions, um, and you can learn about different actions. And I'm just going to sort here on land and soil, and you'll see that eco landscaping and uh, tree planting is one of them. So Jessica, I'm going to ask you to read what we've written here and see if there are any edits you would suggest based on your wonderful presentation. So this describes what you can do and points people to a, a series of resources and some steps you can take. So Shirley and Dave and Janet, if you think there are things <clears throat> here that you would like to add or suggest, we're, it, this could be a place where we include some of the information that was sort of frequently asked or things that will help get folks started. And for those of you that are eco landscaping, I just really would hope people would submit a testimonial because then if you wanted to do it, you could see who's done it and find out who they are and they could say, hey, I don't mind being contacted to um, if you just uh, contact me if you want to um, learn more about what I've done. This is a website. If you do put a if um, that we now have, I think, five or six congregations using um, and we think it helps us um, get to our goals. We have a Bethel goal, but as more congregations join, we have goals around number of households. So um, hope that folks will, um, I know you're on a lot of things and you have emails and passwords. You can now sign in as a guest. And if you don't want to create another password, um, but we really would like to count and see who's doing it. And I think it'd be great to find a way to keep this uh, conversation going if we create a team at Bethel of um, people interested in native plants, then you guys could all communicate in that team um, forum. So just something to think about. Um, and Jessica, I learned a whole bunch of stuff as I did from Dave and Janet and from Shirley, whose garden I've seen many times and I would encourage people to go to Shirley's garden for sure. All right, back to you, Linda. Thank you, Linda, for organizing a great, um, a great group. Uh, presenters. Thank you. And thank you for everybody who participated and particularly Jessica and all the marvelous gardeners we have at Bethel. I love your idea of creating some form of, of team of some of others, sort of a subgroup maybe to, to be able to support one another in doing more sustainable things around gardening. Thanks. Uh, Thanks all for participating in this. Um, I will put into the chat here just before we finish the link to the JCAN. Actually, Ellen, if I can ask you to put the link to the JCAN site into the chat. You're on mute, Ellen. Um, and the reason I'm asking Ellen to do that is there are any number of other actions that are going on all the time, uh, other possibilities. Um, this last week, there was a webinar that was hosted by a number of communities on induction stoves. Um, and if you're interested in the idea or wondering what the heck is an induction stove, um, you can click on the recording and learn everything there is to know about that. So I'd encourage you to look not just at uh, events, activities that are, are in the future, but also look at the past because the recordings are there and it's a great way for you to, to learn about new ways to become more sustainable in your home. So John, can I, can I take progress? I see a Sheila here on the, on the, uh, my tile. Sorry, Sheila. Sheila, um, I, I maybe can just end us on a very positive note. Sheila sent John and I a very nice email, but just saying that through things like this, it had prompted them to do to do some things. Sheila, do you want to end us with a three, four sentence? Uh, you know, why it's felt good. You're muted though, Sheila. Still muted. Okay, got it. Um, I think the biggest thing we've done based on the webinars is going to a heat pump system for the whole house, heat and air conditioning. Uh, that was huge. Um, some of the other things that we've discovered is 
purely by accident, we've put in native plants in our gardens, although we still have a lawn that Norman every year cuts back just a little bit more, um, <laughs> among other things. But the webinars have been amazing. And Jessica, we learned so much this evening. But thanks to you and John and Linda for an unbelievable uh, program. There are also uh, videos on the website under uh, the Green Team on Bethel website. Great, Th and thank you for help doing the website, which allows us to archive everything. All right, uh, Jessica, I know you were um, nervous about doing this. I, I think we all give you an A plus. Uh, thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah, really. Uh, do it again. <laughs> uh, you're good at this. Do it again. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great evening and uh, happy gardening. Yep. Okay, John, I'm going to sign off. All right. Hey, guys, I have a couple questions left. Um, to whom should I send them? You can send them to me, Sally, and I can okay. get them over to Jessica. Okay, thanks. Sure. This was great, thank you. And Joel, is there a coordinator on uh, garden stuff? Who can I send the, uh, interested folks to? You're on mute. I'd be glad to take names of anyone who's interested and uh, um, we can certainly use all the help we can get. Great, all right, well, how, I'll follow. How about, ahead, Howard? how about donation of plants from uh, people's gardens? Because uh, a lot of these plants do uh, propagate and spread uh, and uh, some of them might be welcome in uh, the temple garden. As long as we get people who can water them during the summer, or the fall may be a better time to oh, take okay. them. Right. Or in the earlier in the spring, perhaps for some of them. Right. Already too late. <laughs> uh, after the past weekend, it seems like it could be. <laughs> yeah. So Joel, I'll follow up with you, maybe, uh, and Linda, and maybe we can have just a conversation about how to to um, organize this group in a way that would be most helpful for you. Thank you. And uh, the the committee isn't just me, but uh, we can uh, try to get together and see if uh, Judy and, uh, and Gina. Janet? Uh, Gina. Uh, oh, yes. Are, Gina. Are, yeah. Are still, that's that's uh, Gina, Gina Blinderman and, and Judy Gibbion. Right. Yeah. Okay. The three, three of us have been sort of the basics, but we could certainly use a lot more help. And uh, we are all aging and. Uh, could use some youthful, youthful energy as well. Well, um, I'll, I'll ask you to, you can be thinking about it. I think people are easiest to turn out on a specific day as opposed to ongoing commitments. So we recognize that we're moving into summer, but if there's um, a opportunity where you think, a, a, you know, a, a late spring cleanup or maybe a fall prep or something like that, where people can come out, meet each other, realize, oh, there's a community here. Um, I think that would be great. So you just give yeah. some thought about what would be good. Yeah, we've tried that in the past and it's been successful sometimes, but uh, uh, it, uh, it depends. So uh, it would be helpful also to have some people who are regularly at shore who could water or do things that are needed uh, in between those meetings. Right. No, fair point. Fair point. And, and there may and, be and other may, and, may, and maybe for bad ha for, for bad heat waves, uh, <laughs> have a have an emergency crew. For... There we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Certainly, people near the show would be helpful mm -hmm. to uh, to have that. Good. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, John. You, this, was, this was wonderful. Good That's work. Great. Good. Good program. Well, I, uh, kudos to Linda for organizing. She was, yeah. she was the genius. Thanks, Howard. Have a great Thanks. evening, everyone.
You too. Thank you.